what we're going to talk about today, so we're actually going to basically take the same example, a new example today. Uh, if you didn't finish the Pi example, carry on with it, but, but the new example for today is, I'll explain at the end of the lecture, is, is sending messages around a ring. And we're actually going to take that exercise all the way through. So there's four lectures and four practical sessions today, but we'll be reusing the same exercise with a different focus throughout the day. So what I'm going to talk about just now is non-blocking communications. Now, um, you'll have seen um, from uh, the, well the general talks about point to point that there are there are three ways sensible ways of sending messages in MPI. There's synchronous send, which is what um, we've been using, and it's totally well defined what it does. It's 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 synchronous. There is um, buffered send, which is asynchronous. And for reasons, it's sort of not entirely clear, but people don't really program with buffer send. Okay, people don't program with buffer send. Buffer send is guaranteed to be asynchronous. It's like posting a letter. But the, the slight technicality in MPI is that you have to, as we explained in the last lecture yesterday, it's up to the user to supply the buffering space, and that's just a hassle. So the rationale is that you use MPI send. MPI send can decide, MPI decides, will I send this synchronously as a synchronous send or asynchronously as a buffered send? And it will decide based on a number of factors. It might decide based on message size. It might say, well, I'd like to send this as a buffered send, but I've run out of buffering, so I'll send it synchronously. But the important point is you have to worry about deadlock because the bit, most people write programs using MPI send. But MPI send can be synchronous. Okay, it might be so. When you write a program, you should always assume that your sends could be synchronous. They might block until the receive is posted. That's why you should write all your programs with MPIS send, synchronous send, so that it's guaranteed to be correct. Okay. Now the problem is even a very simple communications pattern like the one we looked at in the um, cellular automaton traffic modeling example. The classic communications pattern in a, in a domain decomposed MPI program is everybody sends to their neighbors up the way, everybody sends to their neighbors down the way. And that blocks, that, that, that uh, deadlocks with you use synchronous send. So what we're going to talk about now is how to get around that, and it's called non-blocking communications. So this is a, you know, this is a classic pattern with a slightly strange numbering, but everybody wants to send to their neighbor in a ring, okay? Um, and th this you, you can't do with synchronous send. It will block. It will deadlock. Now, you might say, well, actually, I can do this with synchronous send if I don't have periodic boundary conditions. If, for example, the last processor didn't send the message, okay, because you didn't have periodic boundary conditions, then it would receive from one, and then, then, then you would break the deadlock. The problem there is that you want this communication to all happen at once. Every sends to their neighbor at once. But if you do this with synchronous send, in a situation without periodic boundary conditions, it won't deadlock, but it will be incredibly slow because, you know, three will send to zero and then one will send to three, then five will send to one and there'll be this ripple effect, which is not what you want. You want everyone to send to their neighbor at the same time. So there are two concepts in MPI. One is the mode, which we've talked about, which is a formal definition of when a messaging operation completes. That's synchronous or asynchronous. Sending a letter completes when the letter is in the post box. Sending a, making a phone call completes when you have spoken to the person and put the phone down. Right. So that's that's a, a conceptual definition of when complete. So, but to these two things completing mean different things. Okay. However, there's a separate a concept which is the form and the form is when does control return to the user program so normally if you call a, a um, if you call a messaging operation like a send you would expect that it only returns control to you when that operation is finished okay however you can imagine a situation where return controllers return to you immediately so in some senses you don't do you ask somebody to say look um, um, sending a parcel is maybe a good example. I'll come back to it. You ask somebody to do something, like make a phone call, and then you go off and do something else, and then come back and check whether the phone call has been completed. So maybe more off. So this is this this in in in, in um, MPI is called the form. So the mode is asynchronous or synchronous. That means uh, buffered or or um, sorry the other way around. It means S send or B send. But the form is is a slightly more technical concept. So blocking operations, the one you've used. A blocking operation, so, so blocking returns 
relates to when the operation has completed, um, relate to when, when control is returned back to you. So you only return, sorry, in a blocking operation, you only return from the subroutine call when the operation is completed. That's normally what you'd expect. If you, if you write data to a file, you expect that when the function returns back to you, the, the data has been written. And those are the routines you've used so far, S, send, and receive. However, you can imagine a non-blocking operation. So if you send a fax in a blocking way, you go to the fax, you put the, um, the paper in the fax, you press send, and you stand there and you wait till the fax has been sent. When the fax has been sent, it's a synchron it's synchronous operation, you know it's completed. However, you could imagine doing something different. You could imagine going to the fax, putting the, the paper in, pressing the button, then going off and doing something different, doing something um, like some work, pulling a lever, and coming back later and waiting for the beep. So here what you've done is you've split the communication into two phases. You've split it into initiation and completion, and in the, in the, in the interim period you can do something useful. Now you might think that what you tend to do is work here. People think, ah, oh, this is great. What I can do is I can start sending a message, go away and do some useful work, calculation, and come back later when the communication is finished. In fact, that's, I mean, that does have its uses, but 99% of the time, what you, do, what you do here is you use this to break deadlock. So rather than standing at the fax machine while somebody's trying to send you a message which you can't receive, you initiate the send on the fax, you go away and do some other work, which is typically some other communication, maybe a receive, and then you check your send has completed. So it's, I'll come up to specific examples. So the, the best analogy I can think for them is when you, um, when you um, send a, a, a parcel by a courier. So if you want to send a heavy parcel by a courier, like these, these um, heavy boxes of MPI manuals, you phone up the courier and you say, like, I'd, I'd like to send a parcel from Germany to, um, to EPTC in Edinburgh. Could you do it, please? Yeah, that's fine. What do they give back to you? Put the phone down, okay? What do they give you? Do they... Later on, you're going to phone up and ask whether it's finished or not. How, how can you, when you phone them up later, how can you check if your delivery is completed or not? So. Exactly, you get a reference number. So whenever you initiate a communication with a, 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 um, a courier company, they give you a ticket. Okay? They say, right, that, that, that's, uh, that's, that's communication number, delivery number 8753. And it's up to you to remember that ticket. Right? If you forget the ticket, then the communication may or may not complete, but you have no rest. So it's up to you to remember the ticket. Okay? You don't specify the ticket. You don't phone up the courier company and say, could you deliver the parcel? I'd like it to be delivery number 87583. No, you say to the courier company, deliver the parcel. They tell you what the ticket number is. And then later on, you phone up and you say, has it completed? And when it has completed, right, they can then reuse that ticket. They can say, right, 8734 is completed, and then they can maybe reuse that ticket later on for another delivery. And in MPI, all non-blocking operations, which is like phoning up the courier company, initiating a, a, um, a, um, a delivery, all non-blocking operations should have a matching weight. Okay? You always have to confirm or wait for the communication to complete. Otherwise, the system can't free resources. So if you never, I mean, it's slightly different here, but if the courier company never gets confirmation that the, that, the, that, the, that the parcel is being delivered, if you never signed for it, they have to remember this ticket. It just hangs around, okay? So, 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 and, and there's internal resources being used up there. The other thing that people do is they say, right, I'm going to use non-blocking operations. So they, they, initiate, they initiate a non-blocking operation, then they wait for it to complete immediately, okay? That has achieved precisely zero, okay? If you initiate the fax communication and then immediately stand there waiting for it to complete, that is exactly the same as a blocking operation. The whole point about having separate initiation and completion phases is that you pull them apart. In code, you know, you pull the lines of code apart and you do something else in the middle, okay? So there's nothing magic. They're not magic. If you initiate something and wait, if you, if you send a, um, a parcel, if you're saying, that, I don't want to drive to Edinburgh, to Glasgow to deliver this parcel, I get a courier company to do it. If you 
phone up the courier company and then spend the next two hours on the phone asking them if it's been delivered, right? You've achieved exactly nothing. The whole point is you're supposed to put the phone down, go and do something else and come back and check later. So you have to do something useful between initiation and completion, okay? So it's, there's nothing magic about non-blocking communications. It just allows you to pull initiation and completion apart. Non-blocking operations are not the same as sequential subroutine calls. The operation continues after the call has returned. So you're spawning off, and that gives that have some technical issues in both C and Fortran, but more so in Fortran, um, because Fortran's a more sophisticated language, actually. You have, you have to be slightly careful here, because the compiler doesn't understand what's going on. The compiler thinks, I've called the functional subroutine, it has returned, everything is over, okay? Now, in fact, that everything is not over. You have initiated something which is going on under the hood. So that will give us a couple of technical issues which we'll come back to. So you separate communication into three phases. You initiate the non-blocking communication. You do some work, perhaps involving other communications. And what we're going to do here is we are going to, to involve other communications. And then you wait for the non-blocking operation to, to complete. So when you initiate the communication, you get a ticket. And when you wait, you say, OK, I've done all the work I can do. I'm now going to wait until communication number 5763 has completed. If there's more than one communication outstanding, you have to remember more than one ticket. MPI gives you the ticket, but you have to remember it. Okay, There's nothing magic going on here. When everyone starts to say, does MPI do this for me? The answer is always no. MPI, just, MPI is, doesn't do anything for you. Right? It's a very simple set of function calls. It's very good at delivering messages, but you have to do all the bookkeeping yourself. There's no, there is no magic going on. This is, I think this is one of my bugs. One of the problems about computers becoming more and more sophisticated is there's more and more of an impression that there's magic. There is no magic going on, right? There is no magic. It's just a function call written by some guy somewhere. You could get download the code, right? There's nothing magic. So a non-blocking send is in some senses like having an outbox. And it's not a perfect analogy, but it's a reasonable analogy. That if I want to send a message... I, I normally have an outbox, but I don't, well, these boxes are too big. Uh, yeah, they're a bit big, aren't they? Anyway, if I want to send a message, okay, think of my laptop as the outbox. Okay, normally I would just say, right, if I'm doing synchronous send, now I'm concentrating on synchronous send, I have to read it. The reason I'm concentrating on synchronous send is synchronous send gives you the problems because it can deadlock, right? MPI send might be synchronous, so you have to always consider the worst case. So I want to send a message. I say, I'm going to send this message. And normally with synchronous send, I just stand there until it's, until it's received. Okay. With a non-blocking send, I set up an outbox. I say, right, I put it there. I ask MPI to send it. And then I go away. Okay. And later on, I can come back and say, has that message been sent? But in the interim, I can do other things. Okay. So having a non-blocking send is a bit like having an outbox. You say, now why it's not completely, this is where it just breaks down because there's no real analogy between doctors and computers. The, the important point is there is no copy taken. This is why you might say, well, why is that different from a buffered send? Okay, why is it different? There is no copy, right? You're saying this is the data, please send it. Okay. And that means that if halfway through you come back and change it, okay, then you've done something stupid because you don't know whether the, at what point the message is sent until you confirm sending by checking the ticket, okay? So in between initiation and completion, you must not change the data because you don't know at which point it's going to... It could have been sent right at the start. It could have been sent right at the end, okay? You must not change the data because you're saying to MPI, please send that document sometime in the future, okay? And until you can know it's been sent, you must not change it, okay? Because you'll get indeterminate, you'll get undefined results. And that's the most common mistake people make is that they change the data before it's actually been sent. Non-blocking receive is like an inbox, as I said. Normally, if I would do a receive, I stand there and wait for the message to come in. What I do with a non-blocking receive is I say, here's where I want to put it, okay? Put it in there when it comes in, and every now and again, you can come and have a look and see if it's come in. You, you cannot read the data until you know it's come in. Well, you can, but you don't know what you're going to get, okay? So again, you, you must not read that data until you know it's been, um, until you confirm it's been delivered. So there are some handles 
the non-block communication, some extra data types. The MPI data type is the same. The communicator is the same. The thing which is new is the ticket. And it's called an MPI speak. Well, in C, it's an MPI request. In Fortran, like all these things, it's just an integer. Well, uh, OK. They've, they've recently, all these sort of handles like communicators and all this kind of stuff now have their own types in Fortran, like they do in C. So, but I mean, this has only very recently come in. So there will be some MPI request objects in Fortran as well. Um, but um, for the moment, I would just say in, in Fortran, the requests are just integers. In C, they're typed as an MPI request. But you should think of this as being the ticket, OK? So, so this, this is the thing you have to remember. The request is the thing you have to remember. So let's look at a, an example. Non-blocking synchronous send is exactly the same as synchronous send. You give it some data, you say how many there are, you say where you want to send it, you give a tag and a communicator, but you specify a pointer to a request, or in C, in Fortran, you specify an integer request. And this is, this is, this is given when MPI S send returns, okay, the data has not been sent, all that has been done is that the, the ticket has been allocated, okay? The data might have been sent, MPI might say, well, that's such a short message, I'll send it now, but you don't know until you check the value of the ticket. So you have to remember this. Later on, you can wait on it. You can do a wait on, the, you can say, has this request finished, okay? Now, you'll see there's a, there, there's a status value on the request. You'll see there's a status, there's a status parameter um, assigned, sorry, provided to the wait. If you're waiting on a send, the, rec the status parameter doesn't really have any meaning, really. Um, it's only really relevant for the receive. Ha Technically, it does. So in MPI, you are allowed to cancel messages. Okay, You can actually send a message, then cancel it. Now, it's a horrible thing to do. And, and in scientific and technical programming, we're typically doing fairly regular things. You never use it. I mean, it's not a good, pr but, but technically, if you did an MPI IS send, and then you canceled it, when you did the wait, the status would tell you, oh, actually, that message wasn't delivered. It was canceled. But, I mean, you should never do that. Sorry, somebody had a question. Yeah, uh, now communication So that's a very good question. So the non-blocking synchronous and buffered are, they're achieving the same thing. But as they are, they are subtly different. So the disadvantage of buffered is that you have to, you, you, the user, have to supply this buffer space. And in, in some cases, you don't know how much to supply. It's not obvious, you know, how much to supply. You have to, oh, our messages are one megabyte long. Oh, but there's a header on it. Oh, I'll add 20%. That'll be enough. But what happens if you do lots of buffered sends? And so, 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 but it's simpler. Using, using buffered send is simpler than this. So the, the good thing about non-blocking sends is that, um, so yes, the, the, and maybe that's why people don't use buffered send. I mean, it's, buffered send mandates that there is a copy. Buffered send says, you will copy this message, okay? And copying is very slow on, on machines. I mean, there's one thing that modern computers are terrible at, it's copying memory from A to B. I mean, um, memory bandwidths are just appallingly slow. So. Um, MPI B send is in some cases a relatively simple way to program, but I wouldn't recommend it because it mandates the copy, whereas this is saying to MPI, look, well, not IS send, but I send is saying, look, if you want to copy it, because this, if this was MPI IS send, it's, it might copy it. It might say, well, I'll just take a copy, you know, and then, um, and then it, you know, the request, it might give you a null ticket. You, know, you don't know, but it, it gives MPI more freedom. So you're right. It's a, it's a sort of a, it's a technicality as to what the, sorry, it's a, it's a personal preference as to which you use. That's right. Except that you, the, 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 so you're absolutely right. If you do buffered, you're guaranteed that as soon as it returns, you can, you can alter the data because you know it's taken a copy. The subtlety is you have to provide the buffering space. And that is, in simple cases like halo swapping, you can guarantee there'll never be more than two outstanding messages at once, for example. Um, but again, the, the disadvantage of buffered is you're mandating that the system copies it, and that is often not, not, um, um, not a good idea. So 
non-blocking receive, so non-blocking send is the same as blocking send, except you have an extra parameter. Non-blocking receive looks the same, but there's something missing there. Well, there's something added. We, we specify the receive. So this is like saying an, a non-blocking receive. So I is supposed to be immediate. It, 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 it is supposed to tell you, remind you that this functional subroutine call will return to you almost immediately. Okay. That's why the I, what the I is supposed to mean. So, so I receiver's got a ticket, a request. Clearly, the, you know, you set up a non-blocking communication, a receive, and, and the, um, the system gives you a ticket to refer to that in the future. But there's something missing from the receive. What's missing from the normal receive? Status. Because what the status tells you about the message that actually came in. But of course, by definition, when the, in the I receive returns, the, the message hasn't come in. So that's why you supply the status at the wait. Wait says, please, please wait until this communication has finished. And if it's a receive, the status will be filled in. You'll see that there is no receive request, send request. There are just requests. MPI remembers whether it was a receive or a send. Um, so uh, again, for, if, if you're waiting on a send, then the, the status is not really of any interest. But if you're waiting on a receive, then it, may, it, probably, it probably is. You might want to look at it and see well, like, what actually came in. So a, night, a use case, oh yeah. How is the process most request number in the CCD? How is it notified by the... Well, well the, on the, uh, when, you, when you call the receive, you, you, you pass a pointer and then MPI initializes that. That's given back to you and you have to remember it. So my understanding was that it, it, it returns to the process that has sent the So it's stored somewhere in the memory no, uh, that belongs to the first changing process. No, no. Everything in MPI is local. I can't. So if I. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Right. So I'll come back. So. Um, if I, if you issue a non-blocking send and I issue a non-blocking receive to receive that, we both have our own request. They're separate things. They're separate things. So non-blocking doesn't refer to the, the communication. It just refers to how you initiate it. So, 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 so for example, you could do a non-blocking send and I could do a blocking receive. Okay. So you'd have a request to refer to the send part, but I wouldn't have one for the receive part. So they're not the same, yeah. Not the they're not the same. Okay, ah, that's an important point. So, so that's actually an interesting one. The request doesn't actually refer to the communication. It refers to purely to the bit you have initiated. So it re refers to the sending of the message or the receiving of the message. In flight, a message is just a message. It doesn't really know. Um, oh, there's a slide which sort of alludes to that. Okay, well, this is this slide, okay. Huh. Send and receive can be blocking or non-blocking. A blocking send can be used by the non-blocking receive and vice versa. It, so it's just like saying, you know, if I send an email, I don't care if somebody sent it from Outlook, Outlook Express and I read it on, you know, on some um, Thunderbird on Ubuntu. It's just a message, okay? Well, I might care because there'll be huge amounts of garbage on the message. So I can't read any of that. But messages just messages, okay? Once they're in flight, they're just messages. It doesn't matter if a message was sent as a buffered send or a non-blocking synchronous send or anything. Once it's in flight, it's just a message, okay? It's off. And at the receiver, it can choose to receive it how it wants. Of course, of course, there's something going on under the hood because if it comes in and it's, it's synchronous send, the receiver then has to get back to the person and say, well, I've received it. But that, that's all under the hood, okay? You don't, you don't see that. So, so, so... So they must remember somewhere what they are. But to a user, a message is just, just data in flight. Um, blocking said, yeah, non-blocking said, can use any mode. Uh, synchronous, buffered, standard already. I'll cover them. Synchronous mode affects completion, not initiation. So what it means is um, if you specify synchronous mode, it, 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 it changes what it means for the message to have completed. So well, I'll come back to that. So, so synchronous send runs the danger of, of deadlock, okay, as we've seen. So you often use MPI IS send, okay? So that's the standard way. Instead of using synchronous send, you use a non-blocking synchronous send, which allows you to break this deadlock problem. Because send could be synchronous, if you're programmed with send, you will end up using I sends to make sure that your program doesn't deadlock, okay? You should, if you, you should never use ready send, so you should never use IR send. 
For completeness, there is a non-blocking buffered send, so which technically has a meaning, but isn't any use. So if I issue a buffered send and the buffered send completes, what, what, what has happened at that point? What is guaranteed to have happened at that point with buffered send? Yes, it's guaranteed the message has been copied somewhere safe so I can carry on and reuse the buffer. So technically, a non-blocking buffered send could return before the data had been copied to the buffer. So if buffer copies were really slow, you could, I mean, in practice, they're not of any use. They're just there for completeness. So, so the ones you will use in this course, you should program with MPI IS send and possibly MPI I receive. That those are the two you should use for the examples. So it if, when you complete a message, you can wait. So you can say, I, right, I, remember I, I initiated this, you know, this send. I'm just going to wait till it completes because I need to reuse the reuse the data, for example. Or you, you've said, right, I've done all the work I can do. I, I, I can't proceed till I get that receive. So you can wait on a receive. Okay. However, you might want to test. So for example, if we've got this worker um, controller worker thing, if all you guys are doing work for me, in, in the standard model, um, what I would do is I'd issue a non-blocking, sorry, in the standard model, I would issue a receive with MPI any source. So I would just stand here with a receive from MPI any source, and every now and again a message would come in and I'd wake up, process it, give you some more work and wait. But I'm spending all my time waiting, why don't I do work as well, okay? So what you could do is you could send up a non-blocking receive with MPI any source as the, um, as the, as the source, and periodically test, say, well, is there a message? Do some work and come back and say, well, is there a message here? And that's MPI test. You get a flag, which is true or false, or one or zero, depending on whether there, it, whether that, whether there is anything to do, whether, whether the message has completed or not. Um, so um, so wait, wait until it comes in. Test says, has something come in? And, and that allows you to periodically test if there's anything happened, if there's anything there. Um, so, so in Fortran it's a flag, and in, C, in Fortran it's a proper logical, in C it's just an integer. Again, MPI test status is only completed, f uh, filled in if test is true. Otherwise it's... So you can actually test or wait for the completion of one message. You can test or wait for completion of all messages. You could test or wait for completion of as many messages as possible. So this is test or wait, test all or wait all, or test some or wait some, and there's a test any or wait any. The prototypes get really, really, um, uh, get really, yep. So wait definitely blocks. Wait blocks, yeah. But if you do a receipt, Do you mean a normal receive? So an I receive it initiates it, so it doesn't. So every, every non-blocking communication just initiates something. You always have to wait or test later on. So if you issue an I receive, you're just saying, right, I want to receive a message. When it comes in, put it there. Okay. And then later you can come back and decide to wait for it to come in or test to see whether it has come in. But but it's a, but the I receive itself just initiates the communication. Initiates tells the system where the buffer receive buffer is. You get a ticket back to refer to that, and then later on you come back and see what's happened. You, yes, exactly, and then wait. And the wait, um, so an I receive followed by a wait is exactly the same as a normal receive, where you set it up and then you just wait, and they're, they're, the idea is to pull, pull them apart. Okay. Um, so the other thing I might do is rather than having a, um, Rather than having an inbox with a, with a source of MPI, any source, I could set up an inbox for everybody. So I do an I receive to you, and I receive to you, and I receive. So I have an outstanding I receive for all all the workers. So I have a huge array of them. I have to remember all those tickets. Okay, a big, I have a big l whole load of inboxes, and then I could do an MPI test any and say, have any of these things, and MPI will say, yes, you've got one there, and I could process that. There's also an MPI test um, sum, 
which says which gives you which says which of these is completed and you get an array back and it says well that one that one that one and that one is completed and that would deal with all you and then move on again so so you can have multiple non-blocking comps the biggest mistake people make is if they have more than one outstanding communication they forget to to have more than one ticket so they'll an issue a non-blocking send and remember the ticket They'll issue a non-blocking receive, remember the ticket, but put it in the same variable. So it overwrites the first one. So you've lost, you've lost the first one. If you have more than one outstanding operation, you have to have more than one. It's up to you to, re to remember the ticket. Okay, you have to have request one, request two. You can reuse them once you've waited on them. Once you've waited on them, that's fine. They're done. You can reuse them. But while they're outstanding, you have to remember them. So this is a point. To say, so if you want to break the deadlock in very simple cases, and the communications pattern in um, the communications pattern in the traffic model is this a simple case of message round a ring, everyone sending to their neighbour. You can actually there is a single routine which allows you to do it's called NPI send receive. All you do is rather than the, the problem with 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 the with um, the message round a ring is you want to issue a send, you want to issue a receive, but by issuing the send. Nobody can issue the receive. So NPI send receive says that just do them all at the same time. And NPI send receive is just the parameters of the send and the parameters of the receive stuffed into the same routine. So you have send buff, send count, send type, dest, send tag, receive buff, receive count, receive type, source, receive tag, com status. It's just everything stuck together in one core. That guarantees to break the deadlock in simple cases. So, well, NPI will guarantee this completes, okay? I don't know. It might, I don't know how it does it, there's loads of ways you could do it. And you can use this in simple cases. In the cellular automaton case, you can do a send receive with your neighbor. Well, you, you think you don't actually do a send receive with your neighbor, you send to your neighbor up the way and receive from your neighbor down the way. It's, it's slightly subtle, but, but you can use it. However, the reason I don't recommend using it is it doesn't generalize. For simple cases, you can use it, but it doesn't generalize to more complicated cases. You should, you, should, you should do the message around a ring example. You can program the send receive just to practice, but the, the most important thing is to use non-blocking communications because they generalize to more complicated patterns where you have multiple people or different numbers of senders and receivers. Very simple cases you can use send receive.